from Beavertail Lighthouse in Jamestown. We're here today on a day that we all need a lighthouse keeper for. This is a wonderful place to come and normally it would be sunny and warm. We're going to give you a nice sweep of the ocean here and show you the rocks that some ships have landed on. There's a marker in the distance that warns people that they're very close to shore. If it were foggy, we would be using that foghorn, which is extremely loud, which has a sensor over by the house, and it sounds within six miles of this place. This is the Beavertail Aquarium, and now we're coming to the light tower that was built in 1859 and stands still. It is now automated, but we'll talk more about that later. We're headed into the house now, and we're getting greeted by Linda, who is a member of the Beavertail Light Board. And thank you for having us, Linda. We're delighted to have you. Welcome to the lighthouse. It's the first lighthouse in Rhode Island and the third lighthouse in the colonies. It was established before it was the United States of America. Pretty exciting. And you've lived here a long time, so you feel like you're really able to tell us a lot about the lighthouse. I am, and I've been, been volunteering here for a long time. We're all volunteers here. And uh, I, I enjoy meeting all the people that come here, and especially the people that come back that used to live here. And you've made a lot of changes in the last few years, since 2009. We have indeed. We've done a lot of restoration and we've opened the museum up to a larger museum so that uh, the, we can have more exhibits. And uh, there's been a lot of work done just this past year and even some of our docents haven't seen it yet. Wow, well you've really moved, moved into the new millennium, 2015, not even 2014 as far as I can see. Really wonderful graphics and everything, thank you. So we're looking forward to coming in. So welcome Linda and thank you for thank being you. our guide and thank you for welcoming us. Yes, this room actually was the kitchen for the keeper's quarters uh, from the doorway in Maccabee uh, this direction was all part of the keeper's quarters and then on the other side, the original part of our museum, uh, that was the assistant keeper's side. This building was built first in 1898 and uh, uh, 1856, I'm sorry, and uh, it was built at the time that the new tower was built. And then the keeper's quarters was added in uh, 1898, the assistant keepers. But uh, there's been many families that lived here. One of the families that was here during the 1960s uh, was a family with 10 children. And that keeper still lives here in Jamestown and some of his family do also. 
So it, it, the history continues, is what you're saying. It does, and the daughter of that keeper was one of our volunteers for several years, coming and, and imparting what she knew to people that visited us. Now this isn't the first lighthouse that was built here. Correct. The first lighthouse was built here in 1749, and that structure only lasted for four years before it burned to the ground. Of course, they were using open flames at that time, and so it was a lot uh, more dangerous that way, and that was made of wood, so it burned easily. And uh, it was replaced in, in uh, four years later, and in 1853, by a, a, a different tower that was made of uh, stone and rubble stone, some of it coming from uh, the islands off of Newport. And uh, that one lasted very well until the British um, were in Newport. They occupied Newport during the war. And uh, when they left, they left in a hurry because the French were coming to help the Americans. And when they left, uh, they came here and they destroyed what they could of the tower. However, where it was made of stone, they weren't able to burn it to the ground. And that foundation is still here. And that foundation is still here. And that foundation had been lost in time until the 1938 hurricane uh, exposed it. And uh, everyone finally knew that it was still there. It's a nice point of history. So who were the first keepers? The first keeper, I believe, was Abel Franklin. And he was here, um, hired by, uh, actually, I believe, the town to operate the lighthouse. This was before the Coast Guard, uh, was, or the lighthouse service, really um, had this. And uh, way back, before they built the lighthouse here, the colonists paid the Indians to burn pitch fires to help warn the ships. But there have been many shipwrecks. We're going to talk about those in a minute. I understand been. that there was a, a woman lighthouse keeper here, which is pretty interesting, Damaris Whedon. Yes, Damaris's husband was the keeper here. And when he was no longer able to, I think he died, uh, when he was no longer uh, able to do it, then, then she took over for him. And that happened a lot in lighthouses back then. The famous Ida Lewis took over for her father and save many people. And not in this lighthouse though, is that no, here? No. no. Okay. Um, so I think it was amazing that people respected her and uh, saw her as a good, clean and ordered person <laughs> who was willing to work here for many, many years and as did her son. Yes, yes. So often families burning. would help with the work. They would clean the lens, they would um, sweep the grounds, they would make sure that everything was ship shaped so to speak, when the inspectors came by That's to look at it. That's very true. Even in more recent times, um, the children all had to help because the inspectors could come at any time. And if the lighthouse was not being kept up correctly or the light keeper was not doing his duties correctly, he would get basically like a demerit. He, and uh, if everything was right, they got a circular pin of a one color. And if it wasn't quite right, they might get another color. And if there was a great deal wrong, they could lose their job. But the lighthouse would never stop. No. That was no, the goal. No, the lighthouse. There were times in the early days that uh, the lighthouse keepers got in trouble because uh, for one reason or another, the light was not on. It might have been because of um, problems with, with the equipment or something, but, uh, and occasionally in certain lighthouses, not in this one, I don't think, but uh, the keepers just didn't do their job. Uh-huh. Maybe enjoying the scenery too much. <laughs> I found one quote in some of the work that you gave me uh, that says that one lighthouse keeper awake a uh, wife awakened him and said, husband, husband, wake up. She cried, the British are coming or it's the day of judgment because she was so concerned about the force of the wind and the, and the keeper, very gruff and an old salt, grabbed his musket and replied, let him come. I'm prepared for either of them. <laughs> I like that story very much. Yes. 
So anyway, uh, the lighthouse has seen a lot of people come and go. Whole ch children's whole growing up was lived here. They were a part of the whole system in a way. They were, because they all had to help. I'm sure they helped wash windows and floors and, you know, kept everything up, you know, the way it should be. And then when the inspectors came, they had to just uh, sit somewhere quietly and behave themselves. <laughs> I can't imagine a nor'easter and being in this little house with how many rooms? Five rooms or something? And then the two rooms for the assistant keeper and this wind swirling and the waves swirling. It must have been a very frightful thing and they all had a lot of hope. Yes, and the hurricane especially, the hurricanes uh, that hit here were really exciting. <laughs> now, Varjan is here with us. He's going to tell us about shipwrecks. And Varjan, it's so nice to have you here and uh, to have you part of our show, but thank you for welcoming us. Well, our pleasure to have you here as well. Uh, to do a documentary on, on Beaver Tail. Uh, obviously, we're very proud of, uh, of, the, of the lighthouse, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the shipwrecks that took place. This uh, is really out into the ocean, this Beaver Tail little piece of land. So it's obvious that it, you're sort of the first thing that ships would hit. The purpose of the light was to prevent shipwrecks. The purpose of the light was to guide vessels coming in at night and also during the day as a landmark. But even with the lighthouse here back in 1749, we still had a consistency of marine events, uh, incidents, uh, shipwrecks, collisions, uh, fog being the principal uh, cause of many of them. Uh, and uh, we had, we we're showing here in the museum, we have two uh, exhibit areas. One of them is this uh, uh, shipwreck storyboard behind us and to show and identify some of the major incidents that took place in Narragansett Bay over the years with more modern vessels. Uh, but we used to actually go back into the uh, mid-1700s and the early 1800s where we have documented uh, some of the vessels that were going aground that either sunk or had collisions or had uh, uh, disasters. Um, uh, for example, around Canonicut Island, uh, Jamestown, uh, uh, so the name is, is Canonicut Island, and uh, over this period of time, there's been a whole series of, uh, of uh, shipwrecks that took place there. And, there. and those are highlighted, some of those are highlighted down along this lower portion of it. But if you remember by uh, around the 1850s, photography was not uh, available, so therefore a lot of those shipwrecks are not really identified. Oh, well, here's one, 1775, the Diana was a sloop and the date of loss was 6 15, 19, 1775. Pretty amazing that you have all that data. Uh, 1779, the Betsy. Yes, the, the summary that you see here is a, uh, uh, a summary of those events that took place. The details of each one of those uh, um, shipwrecks, each one of those events are documented in greater detail. And in a few minutes, I'll show you that what we're doing regarding the documentation of those. That's pretty I, neat. I, we're down here, is that on right? This side of it is the West Passage. On this side of it is the East Passage. And uh, Newport was a primary maritime center, which was located right around here. And the ship owners uh, wanted the light here to allow them to provide some guidance coming into the East Passage and into Newport Harbor and further on up into uh, uh, Bristol and Providence and, and so forth. Um, so here are some of the incidents that took place around Beaverdale. During World War II, we had a very unusual incident where a motor torpedo boat from Melville, up in Melville just north of Portsmouth, uh, was a training point for uh, military, the Navy training their PT crews. In fact, uh, uh, John Kennedy was trained there in, in PT-109. Uh, but anyway, the PTT boat was coming out of Melville and <clears throat> accidentally launched a torpedo. And that torpedo hit the USS Capella, which was a cargo ship, just in the, char in the channel over here uh, across from Newport. And it was fortunately through the uh, activity of the uh, of the officer in charge at that time and the crew, uh, they finally got steam on the vessel and brought it 
uh, to a grounding uh, off of Jamestown. And the following day they repaired the hole and towed it to Boston for repairs. So that was a torpedoing of a naval vessel by our own uh, Navy uh, during uh, the war. Something we don't want to talk about too much, probably. <laughs> okay, yeah. so here are some fairly large ships. This one is broken in half. And I, uh, the SS Belleville. Yes, there, there were these. Are, these some of these are the reefs that uh, took uh, that are around uh, the Brenton Reef area. Uh, this particular one up at the top. Uh, is a ship that came in and grounded right here, right off the point of being. You can tail. see how small and, the lighthouse and here's is. There's another Navy vessel that was coming out of the bay, out of the East Passage from Newport, and somehow got turned around and went aground uh, right off of the lighthouse. So uh, there were those incidents that took place. I guess uh, uh, some bad of them were, were, were those that uh, uh, had loss of life. The uh, Graham was one uh, example of it. And the worst oil tragedy that we had in the Narragansett Bay was the World Prosody uh, Affair. We grounded on Brenton Reef, and uh, that took place in uh, 1989. We, the the Vivatel uh, Lighthouse Museum Association has taken on a, um, a remarkable project uh, that is now in five years uh, going. And uh, what we're attempting to do is identify every marine event which includes capsizing, sinking, collision, fire, fog, uh, weather. Old all boat. Of, all, of those, <laughs> all of those calamities. Uh -huh. And trying to identify every vessel that at one time had that type of an experience. Okay. We have, uh, we have documented the fact that there are probably 2,500 of those events from the late, 18, late 1600s to present day. Um, out of that 2,500, we have documented in uh, detail 1,600 of those events. And here's an example for one vessel, for example, uh, that was a schooner. And what we do is prepare this, uh, a marine historian actually prepares this document uh, that shows the silhouette or the photograph of the uh, vessel, the location on where the incident took place, and a description of the vessel including where it was built, the size, the type, uh, and also if it had a um, uh, uh, registration number, the registration number, and then the incident itself of what took place. And uh, you've and gotten all this off the web, is that right? Or you had documents here? This is right now is documented here uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on our computer here in, in the museum. And our plan is eventually to have this available on our website. Okay. Uh, but this particular display allows a visitor to come in and select a period of time uh, or a different vessel or uh, the, uh, uh, the various home port where the vessel might have been. Now, behind all of this is the foghorn, right? The well, foghorn that's trying to warn them and it wasn't loud enough, they didn't listen, they didn't hear it or the light, or the, the storm was just too bad and it actually pushed the boat. Yes. A lot of these that I've looked at say fog was the problem. Um, and light doesn't get through fog easily, although in, in, what, two or three miles from here you could see the light. But so let's talk a little bit about the fog horns. I understand the first ones were basically gun cannons, is that right? Yes, the, the first uh, fog horn, the fact that was put in at uh, Beavertail was a cannon and the, the cannon would sound, or a ship would be coming in in the fog, they would sound their gun, they, uh, the uh, lighthouse cannon would be fired to, to, uh, uh, to identify again that the lighthouse was there, and from the gun they went to a bell, uh, and I think that was in 1812 when the first bell was, uh, uh, was installed here in, uh, in Beavertail, and the lighthouse keeper essentially had to go out and, and, and hit that bell uh, and uh, when the fog would roll in. Um, over the years, that bell was transformed into an automatic striker, so the striker would come and hit the bell automatically. So many times today, an hour. Yeah, today we have fog sensing equipment and uh, outside of the lighthouse next to the tower there's a atmospheric sensor that looks out uh, it's an infrared device that looks out, uh, uh, looks out over the water and detects the particle density uh, in the air. When that density 
of particles uh, gets up to a threshold, it turns on the fog signal. That's a fog, long, okay, go ahead. And the fog signal is a, is a fog horn. Now, prior to that time, there were all sorts of problems with fog signals. I heard and, there was one that was driven by horses. And one was driven by horses, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think it was in 18, uh, um, 78 or 79, uh, there actually was a horse-driven uh, compressor uh, in a building here on the site where the horse actually walked on a treadmill and the treadmill then was connected to a compressor and compressed air was, uh, was built into this tank and the tank compressed air then blew the foghorn. So that eliminated the problem of the keeper going out and either finding a way to to uh, compress the air or to ring the bell or what have you. So that fog signal trumpet uh, <laughs> was operational for a number of years. I feel sorry for the horses. But let me just you mention know. some of the problems with uh, 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 the fog. Uh, there were anomalies that took place and if I can just show you on this map, here we are down here at the lower end of Connecticut Island and uh, in the uh, in the uh, um, period of 1880, uh, this ship, the USS, uh, the SS uh, Launchmont, was traveling from New York, going up into Providence, and apparently it could not hear the fog signal at Beaver Tail. And what happened? It ended up off of Bonnet Shore as it hit a rock, and it was it was lost. Fortunately, all the passengers had taken off of it. But what, what the captain claimed was that he had never heard the fog signal blow at Beaver Tail. As a result of that, the Coast Guard, or I should say the Light Lightsaving Service, in addition with the Navy, uh, started writing, making some tests along here to determine why the fog signal could not be heard. And what they found was there were anomalies where the fog signal was non-responsive. You couldn't hear it. There were areas in the area that were dead acoustical uh, voids, uh, and these uh, areas here uh, in black show what they are. Those areas still exist today. Today, you can still sail down the West Passage if the foghorn is blowing, reach these points along here, and the sound just disappears. Now, do you think that's because of the rock formation, or what? Well, it's a Probably all uh, atmospheric related. Uh -huh. it, uh, the way the wind blows. Uh, yes, uh -huh. yes. So as a result of that, the U.S. Lighthouse Saving Service selected Beaver Tail to be an experimental station for new fog signal devices. So for a period of years, there were all sorts of devices that were installed here at Beaver Tail, uh, including uh, uh, sirens, including uh, trumpets, including uh, train whistles, there was a series of different apparatus that would work down to try to find out why this problem was, was existing. So a lot of development went on, and that development ended up with other lighthouses uh, throughout the United States. So another way that Beaver Tail was in history. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I think we're going to go see, or is there more? You know, just a couple of things okay. here. Uh, this is a present fog signal. Uh, it's automated, as is our, the light itself and that uh, uh, signal stands right outside the front of the museum. Uh, in earlier days, uh, the fog signal was operated by steam, and, uh, and this large building here next to the keeper building was a cistern that collected rainwater, and that rainwater was collected underneath this building, and the water from that was used to operate the steam fog signal that's uh, shown here on, on this particular diagram. Very, a, and and somebody was building. heating that. Yeah. Heated with wood. That's right. Wow. And uh, during the 1938 hurricane, uh, that particular building was wiped clean and there's the remains of it. And uh, with that, a new building was constructed, which is right outside of uh, 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 the front entrance to the lighthouse. That now is a aquarium uh, operated by DEM. Okay, we need to say that. There is an aquarium here as well if you're coming. So, all right, well, let's move to the light signals. That will be uh, interesting to see. This place that began with native peoples 
lighting fires to, no to get ships to notice the shoreline, now is moving into this, this Millennium Well. This is a light table which is also activated by your finger. And so maybe you could explain some of the things that happens here, that happen here. Anybody who's a historic buff, history buff, is going to want to watch this and to come and use it. Yeah, the, the uh, touch table does a lot for our, our visitors. Uh, uh, we have normally have had uh, storyboards on the wall, and the storyboards are limited with space. Uh, using the uh, touch table, we've been able to take uh, modules of information, educational information, and put them into the computer and have them displayed uh, on this table. And uh, it, this gives the opportunity for a visitor to come in, uh, look at a uh, item that was of interest to him, and then uh, tap on that uh, object and, uh, and begin, to, uh, begin to see the details of the, uh, the, uh, the information module. In this particular case, uh, we did something with the uh, Oliver Hazard Perry, uh, the, which is the new tall ship for Rhode Island, and uh, it will. Uh, and it's a small video that tells you a little bit about uh, about that vessel. Uh, it has both uh, voice and, and video on it. So uh, the Oliver Hazard Perry, by the way, uh, this summer will be uh, sailing uh, as a training vessel for for children. And uh, again, the module gives uh, background uh, information for it. And by simply tapping uh, the, the, uh, the display, we can go back to uh, another module, any new, new module, for example. And, uh, uh, and we had talked a little bit about fog signals. We have one on fog signals. Uh, over on, on this one here uh, is interesting of where a visitor can then follow the story of the early pilots that piloted ships coming into both the East Passage and the West Passage. And this is a story that tells you the background of the piloting that took place in, uh, in Rhode, Rhode Island. I identify some of the pilot vessels, uh, some of the people that were involved in, uh, in doing it, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the pilots themselves on board the, on board the ships, uh, and again, uh, more on the uh, pilot boats. Um, and it continues right on through uh, the history of the early pirates of, uh, of Rhode Island. This is Honest. an amazing resource. I yeah. want, this is just wonderful, and I hope that everybody that's interested in history will come to see it. <laughs>when people come here that they'll hear some of the stories of the, the really wise and um, what civic-minded light keepers that have been here. Walter Eberly, who gave his life during a hurricane in 1938, the hurricane of 38, uh, his whole house was blown away. Uh, trying to keep the light lit, he died. And uh, we don't really think that much about lighthouse keeper being a dangerous job, but it is a dangerous prof profession and it has a lot of dignity with it. And this man standing next to you shows some of that dignity. This, this uniform uh, represents the formation in 1853 of the Lighthouse Board. It grew out of an earlier organization called the Lighthouse Establishment. With the Lighthouse Board came a professionalism, a new professionalism, uh, newer, newer uh, rules and regulations and the uniform service uh, went along with that. 
this, this is the uniform of the lighthouse, the lighthouse board, later the lighthouse service, and it served, uh, which lighthouse service uh, provided lighthouse, uh, with the, the administration for lighthouses until 1939 when the Coast Guard took over from the lighthouse service. This was the dress uniform worn on special occasions uh, for family portraits and other special events. Um, it was a wool uniform, typical uh, uniform services in the early 20th century. The uniforms year-round were wool. This is a, a well-made uh, example of, of that kind of a uniform. Uh, the marking on the collar would represent the K for keeper. If there were a one here, it would be first assistant or a two, a second assistant keeper. That's how the, uh, the uh, ranks were designated. The lighthouse buttons are collector's items. They're attractive uh, and they were made specifically for the lighthouse service, as was the, the cap and the insignia on the cap. Um, with the uh, professionalization of the lighthouse uh, board and introduced in 1853 came increasing uh, policies, uh, rules, regulations, and, and so forth. And the lighthouse keeper's uh, day uh, was spent, uh, a good deal of it was spent in, in, in recording what was happening around him and, and, and the ships passing, what was happening to him. When he, took a va when he took a leave, he had to document his, when he left the station, he had to document all of that. Uh, paperwork began to uh, take up an increasingly important uh, uh, part of his life. Um, medical uh, remote stations, offshore stations, light ships, and remote isolated stations had uh, a complete medical chest that they that they were required to have and and uh, and, and keep fully supplied. Um, this this particular case shows some of the examples of the paperwork forms that were required uh, of the lighthouse keeper um, as he uh, as his job became increasingly professional. In the 1870s, it fell under the newly formed Civil Service Act, and those, those uh, obligations in terms of requirements for hiring and, and it tended to make the, the service a more professional, uh, uh, professional organization. Okay, what started as fires is now becoming very complex as you go through history. And we have um, a, an example here of a beautiful lens, and maybe Richard you can describe it for us because I have to say it's amazing and I read about the fact that it changes the ability of the light, just one small light is uh, sent out a long way. So if you could tell That's, us about it. The Fresnel lens uh, revolutionized lighthouses uh, around the world, it invented in the early uh, first quarter of the 19th century. Uh, the uh, Fresnel lens uh, was able to make lighthouses useful for the first time. Fires and other forms of uh, light had been used uh, very ineffectually because of the fact that they would not travel very far. The Fresnel lens uh, produced a light that was, uh, could reach the horizon on a clear night and, be, and it really made lighthouses useful uh, for the first time. The, the lens came into this country from France in around 1850 and it was, uh, over a period of a uh, number of years, uh, replaced the earlier forms of lighting in American lighthouses. The, the, uh, light can be, the light that is being produced from this, about a million candle power, can be seen from the tower here at Beaver Tail uh, Lighthouse. At, at that height, it can be seen at about 14 miles out to sea on a clear night. That's amazing. And I read that um, it, other lenses only kept something like, um, I don't know, half, less than half the power and this lens kept 80 some percent of all the power yes, of the light. Yes, that's right. The, the, that, that, the useful, the useful uh, power of the light, up to, uh, over, even over 80 percent of the light could be seen out at that distance of, uh, to the horizon. Uh, in this case, uh, about 14 miles. The southeast light of Block Island, which is the first auto lens, a much larger lens, can be seen out about 20 miles on a clear night. The lens was made in France the, the, the interior workings of the light were manufactured in New York State. Oh, so this wasn't made by Mr. Fresnel himself? Uh, no. Okay, now this opens and I don't want to do it. I'll open it. Yeah. And then if we could get inside to look, that small lens is what's <clears throat> was blinking, is blinking. And to me, as I was standing here, it looked about four times taller because the lenses keep um, 
refracting it and making it larger. That's exactly right. That small demonstration lens uh, fills that uh, fills the the entire uh, entire Fresnel lens with light. The the larger uh, the larger uh, bulb in front of it was the, the one of two original bulbs. There was a second bulb in in place, and when one burned out, the second one would come in uh, into place automatically, so that you wouldn't have any break in the service. And they used electricity. Yes, this 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 originally this lens. Uh, by the time this came into service in the in the early 20th century, this had this was uh, had been electrified. Before that, they used kerosene, and the Fresnel lens in this country uh, were uh, used kerosene as a fuel from about 1870 into the uh, early 20th century. Uh, the French engineer um, Fresnel, uh, Jean Fresnel, um, invented this over a period of years uh, in France. And it, he was able to solve. Uh, he was able to solve uh, a, a, the problem of a useful light, um, and his knowledge of physics and optics, particularly, is what, what led to his invention. Uh, his his pro his inventions can be found today uh, on, in a French uh, lighthouse museum, which is located on on Isle uh, Usant off the west coast of Brittany. Uh, but he, uh, he really was, uh, uh, contributed uh, tremendously to the uh, usefulness of, of lighthouses as aids to navigation around the world. So I always wondered how these markers work out in the water, and here's one close up. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, the Coast Guard is responsible for aids to navigation on inland waterways as well as here along the, uh, the coast at the ocean. This is a, a channel marker um, that would be, uh, be floating in the water. It would mark uh, one side of the channel and it was powered uh, by so solar energy. And on the top they had put a solar panel and the uh, rays of light would be collected and it would be enough uh, current to, uh, to operate this light uh, during, during the overnight period. The, um, uh, the, this, feature, this feature on top is an interesting one. Children often wonder why these are here. These were put on here in an attempt by the Coast Guard to keep birds from landing. A couple of seagulls sitting up here after a few hours and this solar panel wouldn't be very useful. The problem with these, the seagulls were still coming, they were landing and they were getting their wings caught in these. In these, oh. so that that experiment uh, did not prove to be successful. These were removed and replaced with a with a pyramid, a, a, like a lucite type pyramid, that would achieve the same effect: keep the seagulls away, let the sun get in, and provide the power. If you were to get, if you were to look inside the lens, you would see that there are about six bulbs, and this is an an attempt by the Coast Guard, a successful attempt to a, a cut down on the maintenance issue. Um, and when a bulb burns out, another bulb will come in place of it automatically so that uh, they don't have the problem of having to run out on a regular basis to replace a burnt out bulb. So again, a, a, a clever and efficient uh, technology uh, adaptation. Varjan, I didn't realize that you're an author. I'm really impressed. Two books about topics that are absolutely germane to the lighthouse. Maybe you could tell us about them. Well, yes, there are two books, um, uh, and one of them, of course, is about uh, Beaver Tail Light, and it's a book that needed to be written because there never was a complete story of the lighthouse, the light station, the development, the lighthouse keepers, who they were, uh, when they were on station, and what have you. So the book really needed to be written, and it was an ideal thing to do uh, as a result of uh, my association with the uh, association. It was Beaver Tail Lighthouse Association, and the gift shop is a great place to have the book available, and the proceeds from all of the profits from the book come to the lighthouse. Oh, thank you. That's the other book is, uh, is a relatively new book, and it's about a story of lifesavers in Rhode Island, and it's a story that very little is known about, but at one time there were nine lifesaving stations located in Rhode Island, including Block Island, and their sole function was to go out in all sorts of weather and save people off of shipwrecks. And it's an exciting era of, of time, during the time period when all this took place, and, and some of these light stations, uh, one of, one of, a few of them, are still in existence, not operating, but turned into either private residence, or the best one is the one that's down at Narragansett, down at the Twin Towers, it's a restaurant. 
And so if you're interested in, in life-saving back in the uh, middle 1800s through the 1920s, and this book covers the story of each one of those stages. And a light ship is not a lightsaver. No, the light ship, we had, there was a light ship that was a mile, uh, less than a mile off of uh, Beaver Tail for many, many years. And that uh, light ship, it was, it was a series of light ships. There were actually four of them over a period of time. And they were eventually uh, displaced by a um, tower, a light tower. And, um, and uh, that light tower later was, uh, was uh, removed and uh, a, a sea buoy was in its place down there. But these, these lifesavers are first responders, is what you're saying, what we would call... Uh, uh, absolutely. It, or were, the Coast Guard, what we call it, the Coast Guard. The, it was the beginning of the United States Coast Guard. In, uh, in 1910, uh, 1920 was when the Coast Guard, uh, with the Revenue Service, began to take over the role of the Coast Guard. This is a model, of course, of uh, the Chesapeake Light Station, the one that was located here off Brenton Reef, had Brenton printed on it. And uh, as I say, they went through a series of four different vessels over a period of years. Uh, we don't know what happened to the last one. Uh, we know that it was uh, eventually towed to Boston. From Boston, it went to uh, uh, Ketchikan, Alaska, and turned into a fish processing ship. And uh, from there, we, we have no record of what happened. Uh -huh. So it still may be around, but uh, we, don't, we don't know the details. Thank you, Varjan. We are really impressed, and I hope everybody gets to read at least one of your books, and uh, all the proceeds go to the Lighthouse, so that is a very good thing. Varjan, we are now in the inner sanctum. This is where it all still works, and this is where the power goes out to save lives, so it's a pretty impressive place. Well, so why this, don't you tell this, us about it? Well, this room actually goes back to 1898 prior to the time that the light was automated. It, today it is used as a, uh, a room that collects the data from the light and from the foghorn which is outside and that, then that information is sent back via telephone lines to the Bristol Navigation AIDS station and they monitor not only this lighthouse, but they also monitor other lighthouses in the uh, southern uh, uh, New England area. So what they do is they collect the telemetry data about the function of the light, whether or not the light is turning, whether or not the fog signal is functioning, and monitor that. And if that fails, uh, the redundancy in the light, for example, fails, and the fog horn fails, then they know about that in Bristol. And they send the crew down here to do, do the repair. Now prior to that time, prior to being automated, which was, took place in 1977, this room was used by the lighthouse keeper to store his tools, uh, lantern oil, uh, the, uh, the uh, paraphernalia that he needed to go up to the top of the tower and to clean the lens and, and what have you. So it really was a, a working room. And it's attached between keeper house and the tower which is beside, uh, behind that door. The apparatus that you see here is, uh, again, to, uh, used for a number of reasons. Uh, one, this is a battery bank down here, and if the power is ever lost, then this battery bank is automatically switched over, and a temporary light on the top of the tower, up on top, is lit, and it keeps the light functioning for as long as the, the batteries last. Hopefully by that time the Coast Guard has noticed that the light is burned out and they'll come down here and repair that, uh, that failure. The switch gear that you see here is test gear as to the testing of the batteries, uh, chargers for the batteries as well, and again the automatic power switchover equipment that's uh, located. And on the walls behind us here, or be in front of me right now, uh, are the various uh, uh, electronics that uh, control the telemetry equipment that goes back to, to Bristol. It's really interesting because it seems like it's so antique and yet it's so state-of-the-art, so modern. So I want to thank you for showing us this room and letting us into the inner sanctum. Now we're going to go up these steps to look at the light itself. Okay, this is the uh, ascent up to the top of the tower, and uh, there are a total of 49 steps 
uh, that doesn't sound like much, but uh, uh, once you start climbing the steps, you'll find out that it's not an easy trip all the way up. And when we get up to the top level, we not only have the step, no more step, but we have a ladder we have to climb. So I'm going to go and seat up uh, to the top. Well, this is at the uh, first landing. We're about a third of the way up to the top of the light. And this uh, one landing, uh, windows looking out to the south, and uh, we'll next proceed up to the next landing. Okay, this, this is now the second landing uh, up the spiral staircase. And where the previous landing, we were looking out to the south, this window in back of me has a has view up to the north, uh, looking up the northern part of Connecticut uh, Island. So from here, we're going to ascend up to a wooden ladder to get up into the lantern room. The lantern room is up above me, one more level. The area we're in right now is called a watch room. And in this room, the lighthouse keeper used to come store his oil uh, relative to carrying it up into the lamp room to fill the oil. Uh, this door here opens up to a catwalk. And the procedure was to open the latches up. And then it had a stone door. And the stone door was also latched. And this stone door opens up into the catwalk. And uh, from the catwalk, we're going to be able to walk completely around the top of the light tower itself. So uh, we'll exit out through that way. This lighthouse doesn't stay so well maintained with such wonderful new additions without help. And some of that help comes from the gift shop where we're standing now. And this was probably the bedroom of the assistant light keeper's house? Or I believe it was the living room. Living room, okay. So we're getting the view that he got out here uh, into the bay. And anyway, uh, Linda, maybe you could tell us about some of the things that are here and how all of the funds from this uh, help to support this work. Right. Um, we try to carry as many things that are made by local artists as possible, local uh, books, local paintings, um, and, and a good selection of, of uh, nautical items. Also, um, our jewelry, most of it has a nautical theme, our toys for the children, and we do pride ourselves in having things that families can afford to buy. We try to keep our prices down because a lot of people come in with children, and of course they all want something. So uh, we, we do keep our prices down, and yet we make money for uh, restoration and uh, actually for the running of the lighthouse. Uh, we depend on all volunteers, there's no one on a paid staff, everybody volunteers their time and uh, we have approximately uh, 60 docents who either work in the gift shop or work greeting people that come to visit us and uh, we get approximately 28,000 people in the course of a summer that come in to see us. And there are, there's an aquarium and uh, this is a wonderful resource. There are places for picnics. Um, there's nowhere to swim, but uh, you can certainly see the water. So I want to thank you, Linda, and everyone for all of the help that you gave us, Varjan. I uh, want to thank you. Um, we really appreciate you welcoming us here, and we hope that lots of people come to visit you this summer. Thank you for watching Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island and the people and places and events that make Rhode Island a great state to live. And what a better example than Beaver Tail Light and its workers and its volunteers.